Okay, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here and share with you from the Word of God. We're in Revelation chapter 14, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 9, and I'm going to read to the end of the chapter, so Revelation 14, verse 9, down to verse 20. And our title this morning is going to be Destinies Decided, Destinies Decided. And so verse 9, it says this, And the third angel uh, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle onto the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. And again, God always blesses the reading of his precious word to us. Well, if you remember in Revelation chapter 14, we just followed chapter 13, which talks about the uh, how the, uh, the dragon is uh, going to accomplish his purposes uh, when he's cast out of heaven. Remember, his time is short, and uh, he, he wants to wreak havoc up, up, up among uh, those uh, that are followers of the Lamb. And uh, so uh, how he's going to do that in chapter 13 is by uh, his puppets, uh, the first and the second beast, uh, this false prophet, the, and then the, the man of sin, the Antichrist. And so it, it seems when you read chapter 13 as if nobody can withstand the power of this mighty uh, satanic trinity. And yet when we get to chapter 14, we have seven little pictures that are given to show us actually that chapter 13 is not kind of the zenith of the beast's power, but actually it's the prelude to his defeat. In chapter 14, we've got these seven little pictures, and these pictures show us that actually Christ is the conqueror, Christ is the victor. And so I, I just go through and uh, just mention the ones we've covered so far. We looked at verses one through five, the sealed of God. We saw the 144,000 that despite the great power that had been given to the beast, he was not able to touch one of God's sealed ones, that each one of them survived through the seven year tribulation period. And we find them standing on Mount Zion with the lamb, uh, having overcome all uh, his venom and uh, being intact, not losing one. And then we saw uh, the second thing 
in verse 6 and 7, the sound of the gospel. And we saw this angel flying through uh, heaven, preaching the everlasting gospel. And what we saw was that even though uh, the beast tries to silence all opposition, uh, there'll be no dissenting voices, uh, and they're going to try and silence the message of the gospel. But they still will not do it because God is still going to get his message out. And so this angel flies through heaven, tells people to fear God, not fear the beast, to worship God, not worship the beast, so on and so forth. And again, just showing that despite his every attempt, he cannot ultimately silence the message of the glad tidings, the sound of the gospel. And then we saw in verse 8, the third picture, uh, the fall of Babylon. And of course, just this, the whole beast kingdom that seems, again, so unassailable, so powerful, and yet uh, its downfall is assured. And now we're in the fourth picture. And this fourth picture is going to tell us about the image and the mark and what happens to those that bow down to the image and take the mark. What will be the consequences of such people who do that? Now, again, many of them are doing it Maybe to save their own skin. They're doing it for short-term benefit. I have to buy and sell. I have to eat. I have to run my business. I have to survive. And so they'll be doing it for whatever motivation. But God wants them to know ahead of time there are consequences to man's choices. Decisions we make have great and great and often grave consequences if we make wrong decisions. And so we'll notice in verse 9, it says, The third angel followed them, that's angel 1 and 2, saying with a loud voice. So again, it's, su it's such a loud voice that nobody uh, can not hear it. It's, it's a clear message that is being given. It says, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, which again is showing your allegiance, your loyalty, receive his mark, in his forehead, we said, suggested that perhaps the more ardent followers of the beast, uh, they'll unashamedly put it right there. Uh, maybe others who are just doing it out of compliance, it might be on his hand. Uh, but either way, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, they're, they're showing this allegiance to the beast. It says, if any man worship the beast in his image, receive a mark on his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture unto the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So there may be some short-term benefits for taking the mark of the beast. You can buy and sell. <laughs> but let me tell you the long-term consequences are horrendous and so isn't it amazing how oftentimes people make decisions with a short-term view <laughs> you know what's pragmatic what's the best thing for me right now but they don't think of the eternal consequences of their choices and here we're told there are eternal consequences and so as we go through this uh we're just going to think about it now i want to again suggest to you that this uh the the taking of the the image the mark of the beast this all takes place at the midpoint that's when the beast's image is set up that's when the control of buying and selling and the need to take the image and the mark take place and so men have now been warned that to take the mark of the beast is to share in his doom because we see they're going to be tormented day and night well if you look at revelation 19 We've already seen this, but we'll, we'll see what is the destiny of the beast because his followers will share in his destiny. Destiny, uh, Chapter 19, verse 20, it says, The beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And then, again, if we look at chapter 20 and verse 10, again, we see uh, that after 
uh, a thousand years, it says the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So even a thousand years down the pike, the beast and the false prophet are still in that place of torment. And now the devil that deceived them joins them there. And so basically to take the mark of the beast, uh, to bow down to his image, is to guarantee that you will share the consequences of the beast. Now, let me just say this. I don't believe anybody will casually or accidentally take the mark. You know, sometimes people say, well, some of the things that are happening now, you know, maybe uh, as the banking system becomes more kind of global and eventually maybe there'll be this uh, this chip that will you can put in that will replace your credit card. <clears throat> but nobody <clears throat> that may be preparing the way, excuse me, for the B system. But let me say this, <clears throat> I don't believe a single person will accidentally or casually take this mark. They know what they're doing. The connection between worshipping the beast and taking the mark will be very, very clear. And so it's, it's not something you can't do it by accident. Although receiving the mark may seem innocent enough to those who dwell on the earth, in their eyes, it may not seem like much more than a mere pledge of allegiance, a, a devotion to the Antichrist and his government. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting how it's very much like the first century. In the first century uh, of Christianity, uh, when to burn a pinch of incense to an image of Caesar and to pledge that Caesar is Lord was regarded generally speaking by many people as an innocent act of civil duty to the to the ancient pagan world that's how they looked on it uh, they didn't think anything of it it was just kind of part of their civic duty but for those that were believers <laughs> they could not do that they could not do such a thing and to them uh, caesar is not lord Jesus is Lord. And to say anything different, they just couldn't bring themselves to do it. And they paid a huge price. And so back in, in, in this, this day here, we're going to see that for many, uh, it, it will just seem, uh, well, this is just part of my civic duty, just like pledging allegiance to the flag in the United States is something people do. And uh, a lot of people do it, and they don't really think anything about what they're doing. They just do it automatically. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea, but it will be very definitely connected to the fact that you're worshiping the beast and his image. You're acknowledging them as divine entities. And so in verse 10, he goes on and he says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. So the idea is this, that God has what we call a cup of wrath. And he makes those under judgment drink of this cup of wrath. Now, it's kind of interesting how in Scripture, this idea of God's cup of wrath, where it's almost like his wrath is distilled into a cup, it is mentioned more than 13 times in the Bible, and not just in the book of Revelation. So it's kind of a common idea of God's wrath being distilled into a cup and then poured out. And so this cup of wrath, I want you just to see a couple of references from the Old Testament that would help us to understand what's going on here. Psalm 75 is our first reference. Psalm 75 and verse 8. It says, for in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup and the wine is red. It is full of mixture and he poureth out of the same but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. And so again, this idea, this cup in the hand of the Lord, and it's directed towards the wicked. The dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. In other words, it's good. this, this cup uh, is going to be poured out on them. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25. Again, we get the same idea. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. It says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup 
This is Jeremiah 25, 15. Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. <laughs> okay, so again, for the nations who God sends this, they're going to drink this wine cup of the fury at my hand, he says. So I think we can see this picture. Now, it's interesting. I was going through the book of Romans in an assembly recently, and I was talking about the Lord Jesus and what he did as our substitute and how he bore our wrath. And uh, one brother was quite adamant that the Lord Jesus did not receive the wrath of God at all. He was sure that that was not the case. But, you know, it's interesting when the Lord Jesus was in Gethsemane and he prayed, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. <laughs> what cup was he, was he thinking of? Was it not the cup of divine wrath against sin, against our sin, that was poured out on him as our substitute? And, and so interesting that the unsaved world, they're going to drink this bitter cup. But it's not a voluntary act. <laughs> they're doing it because of their willful choices. The Lord Jesus, he took the cup and drank it willingly as a substitute for us. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And in those three hours of darkness, I believe that God's distilled wrath against the humanity's sin was poured out on his son in those, in those terrible three hours of darkness. So Jesus willingly took the cup of his father's wrath that we deserved. But here, the enemies of Jesus don't have a choice. The cup is forced upon them. And this, the word wrath here, let's go back to Revelation 14. And again, we'll see the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. In the ancient Greek language, there are two words that describe God's anger, God's wrath. Uh, one is the normal word. It's the, the word orge, O-R-G-E. -E, uh, and it's the common word for God's anger in the New Testament. And, it, and it's the idea of God's settled anger against sin it, it it never changes he's he's always angry against sin uh he's angry at the wicked every day it's it's not like a an outburst it's it's just a continual emotion that god has against sin and evil but the word that's used here when it talks about the the word wrath in verse 10 they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of god is a different greek word it's the word thymos it's only used 11 times in the New Testament, and 10 of them are in the book of Revelation. Now, next time, when we go through Revelation 15, we're going to look at every one of those references. We're not going to do it today, but we are going to look at all those references, uh, and, and we'll see uh, how it's used. But 10 of the 11 are in Revelation. And the idea is this, uh, the word thymos, usually God's anger towards sinners uh, does not flash against them. It's simply his settled, as we said, his settled opposition against sin and unrighteousness. But in the book of Revelation, this word is the idea of some flash, this fiery wrath of anger uh, that's in view here. And so God's ultimate judgment, the term we might describe of his passionate anger is used right here in this verse and used in the book of revelation we said 10 out of the 11 times in scripture it's used more often and so notice too that it says the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out without mixture and what is interesting is that normally god in wrath remembers mercy and so even in in wrath it's mixed <laughs> in wrath he remembers mercy it's tempered by divine mercy but when it says here, which is poured out without mixture, it means there's no mercy there this time. There's no mercy involved. His wrath is poured out. His anger is uh, passionate. And there it's not tempered in any way with mercy. And so he says, and it's very sobering, the same, this is those that have taken received his mark in the forehead or his hand and have worshipped the beast, the same shall drink of the, the wine of the wrath, his passionate anger, poured out without mixture, no mercy, onto the cup of his indignation. And this is the consequences. 
it says, he, the one that has taken this mark, uh, the one who has worshipped this beast, it says that he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. So let's just think about this. It's talking about fire and brimstone. Echoes of Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with fire and brimstone? God has no mercy here, fire and brimstone. And, and it says that they're, they're going to be tormented with this fire and brimstone. And, and it talks about this fact, the smoke of the torment ascends forever. So again, we, we remind it again of other scriptures. And I want us just to look at them because it's interesting how there's a, there's a very uh, kind of common trend, even amongst evangelical believers now, to question the eternality of hell. Right, it's becoming very popular now to play down hell, either just to ignore it plainly, don't even talk about it, or play it down and say, Well, it's only going to be for a while, and then God's wrath will be dealt with, and and they'll all live happily ever after somehow, uh, in, in a state of nothingness or whatever. But let's just look at scripture just for a moment. I want you to see that uh, there's, there's no thought here of something being temporary. Uh, in as we look at the gospel of Matthew and chapter 3 and verse 12. It says, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. Unquenchable fire. So in other words, the fire is never going to be quenched. It's going to be constantly burning. Uh, the Gospel of, of Mark, chapter 9, Mark 9, verse 43. We read these words. It says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Verse 45, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into, uh, halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And so you get this idea that he, the Lord is warning people, look, get drastic about dealing with sin because the consequences of, of sin in a life result in unquenchable fire. That's the end result. And so you've got to be drastic in dealing with sin. Well, of course, the only way for us to really deal with sin is to find a savior who can deal with sin for us. But there's this idea of this is, this is serious. Get drastic. And again, anybody who's going to be listening to this today, it, get drastic. If you're not, if you've never had your sin dealt with, get drastic about it because it's very sobering, very serious. And so this will be the final drink of the beast worshipers. Think about this. This will be their final drink. They the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture to the cup of his indignation. They're going to drink this. And it shows that the suffering of hell is a real torment, that it's a painful and repulsive thing. And we say this, the modern vogue for dispensing with hell has no counterpart in the book of Revelation or in scripture itself. Notice too, and this has been troubling to some, it says, uh, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, end of verse 10, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The presence of the holy angels, the presence of the Lamb. What it does show us is this, that God is not absent from hell. Oftentimes we'll talk about it, and maybe even in the gospel we'll talk about it's a place where there's no, God is not there. Well, is that strictly speaking true? He is present, but he is present in all his holiness and all of his righteous judgment. Those who are in hell will wish God were absent, 
because it is his holiness and righteousness that is finding its end in their their punishment and so they'll wish he was absent but he but he he, he will not be he will be present it, it is wrong to say that hell will be devoid of the presence of god what hell will be devoid of is any sense of his love or any sense of hope that's what's going to be missing the presence of Jesus will be there, but only the presence of his holy justice and wrath against sin. And then it says uh, quite a remarkable thing. And I, I find this as I get older, this verse makes more sense to me than ever before. It says, the smoke of their torment ascends up for ever, ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name no rest day or night i don't know maybe i'm the only one that goes through this but sometimes i find i wake up in the night and i just can't get back to sleep and i know i've got to get up early and i know i've got responsibilities and maybe i've got to preach that day and i'm just tired and i'm saying lord I, oh i just please give me rest <laughs> my wife's even worse she she really has trouble sleeping at night and it's a very difficult thing for her. <clears throat> and I, I just think of this. Uh, to me, it's a terrible thing to, to experience no rest. We need rest, don't we? Uh, uh, we? We desperately need no rest day or night. And what's interesting is they could have enjoyed rest. Because the Lord Jesus... You remember when he was on earth, one of the beautiful things that he says, and let me just read it because I don't want to misquote it, but in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, you read these beautiful words in Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. And what a tragedy that every person that will be in this place of conscious torment, not experiencing rest day or night forever and ever and ever, could easily have come. The Lord Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, <laughs> I mean, it's not restricted. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me <laughs> and, and I'll, I'm going to give you rest. And they, they refuse to come to him for rest and so they're bearing the consequences they they went for the temporary uh, as it were seeming rest of taking the the mark of the beast so they could buy and sell and carry on with life and and enjoy that temporary three and a half isn't it amazing uh, they're trading three and a half years of being able to buy and sell for selling their soul for all eternity Wow, what a what a bad deal! Uh, what the worst deal ever! And so it says <clears throat> that they will be in that condition, no rest, forever and and ever. Uninterrupted duration is in view. Unrelieved, no relief. Unceasing, no ending. Uninterrupted, no rest. Now, this is sobering. This should make us weep, brethren. I just find emotionally, this I find this very affecting to even just talk about these things. So that's picture number four. And it's just telling us, that, folks, there are definite consequences to decisions. I remember a brother had a great impact on my life, but one of the things he kept saying was the awesome consequences of choice. <laughs> the choices we make have awesome consequences. Oh, let's make sure that we make the right choices every day. Make the right choices. There are awesome consequences to choice. Verse 12, we move on to picture number five. And what a contrast. He's already laid out, okay, those that take the mark, those that uh, those that bow down and worship the image, this is, this is their condition. What about those that refuse it? What about those who decide to stay loyal to the Lord Jesus in this time of trial? Well, here's the comfort 
of the saints. And again, it's a beautiful contrast. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. What a beautiful contrast. So he says, here is the patience of the saints, kind of a word of assurance to the saints. God is good at giving assurance to his people. These tribulation saints who are living at this time, they too are making a choice. It's a difficult choice in a sense that they're saying, I'm not going to take the mark. And as a result of not taking the mark, you can't buy and sell. You may well be hunted. Uh, it may be a, a restless experience in a sense that you're, you may be constantly on the run. You're constantly hiding uh, or whatever or being pursued by the beast and his followers. And so against this background of beast worship, as we learn those that keep and again, that's the, the defining word that keep, that 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 hold on to, that, that uh, their constancy is in view here, the constancy of the saints, those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, that are not going to compromise. In spite of persecution, they return their confidence, re retain their confidence in him and his promises. They believe the Lord Jesus. They, they're loyal to him. And, and their patience is in view here. Blessed, here is the patience, the endurance, the, the staying under trial, despite all of the human tendencies to preserve their own skin, they stay loyal to the Lord. They endure, they stay under the trial. And again, don't we have something of that in Matthew 24? Remember, we said there's a lot of parallels here uh, with the Lord's teaching on the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, verse 13, he says, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, we're going to see in two ways here. Uh, for some, it will mean some of them will survive and go into the millennial kingdom. We know that. You're going to have to have believers that survive and go into the millennial kingdom to be able to populate that kingdom. So some of them endure to the end and are saved. Others, uh, they're enduring. They're not quitting. They're, they're being faithful, and they suffer death. But again, what about those that, that die? What about those that, that did, don't just are saved in a sense, temporal saving their life into the millennial kingdom? What about those that, that do succumb and die and suffer? Well, the Lord says, I've got a word for those. Those who die under the persecution of the beast, they won't miss out in any way in the bliss that has been won for them by the lamb it says i heard a voice from heaven saying to me write make sure this doesn't get lost write this down this is an important piece of information and it's the beatitude it's the second of seven beatitudes in the book of revelation remember the first one is in revelation 1 verse 3 where a beatitude is promised to those that read and hear and keep the words of this book and so that's the first beatitude here's the second blessed are the dead which die in the lord from henceforth from now on of course that doesn't take away from the fact that any believer who has died in the lord is certainly blessed <laughs> that is no doubt absent from the body is to be present with the lord in his presence there's fullness of joy at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore surely it's blessed for those that die in the lord but at this particular time in human history you can just imagine what an assurance this is how incredibly happy are those the dead which die in the lord from this point forward as a contrast to those that will die from the mark of the beast what will their experience be well they want to experience rest day or night they're going to be tormented they're going to suffer but for the the true believer in this time blessed are the dead which die in the lord from henceforth yea saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them they enter into their rest <laughs> and what a rest it will be 
a blessed rest. Yeah, and so uh, this voice from heaven, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. By the way, it tells us what this voice from heaven is. It says, this voice from heaven, which says, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the spirit that they may rest from their labors. It's attributed, this voice saying, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, it's attributed to the blessed person of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, remember the seven churches, we had that refrain, he that he has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But apart from that, you don't have much direct evidence of the Spirit speaking in the book of Revelation. Two more occasions, this one here, after the seven churches where he says, uh, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. You have this reference, and then one more in Revelation 22 and verse 17. 22 verse 17, it says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely and so on the one hand spirit speaking about rest on the other hand the spirit in chapter 22 is speaking about reward rest and reward and so <clears throat> his assurance the assurance assurance of the spirit is given here of eternal rest and i'm sure this would would be very encouraging for tribulation saints as they're going through this time, this worst period in human history, this three and a half years, to, to can you imagine what a comfort the book of Revelation will be to them at this time? Can you imagine what a comfort Revelation 14 will be when Revelation 13 seems so real, the two beasts are reigning and, and uh, their power seems to be uh, total. And, and yet having this assurance here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. I heard the voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, the Spirit said they may rest from their labors. Their works do follow them. God is not negligent to forget their labor of love that they've done for him. All their works are remembered and they will follow them and they will be rewarded in a very suitable way because of their loyalty to him. And so we can imagine courage and comfort that this passage will bring to those who have been embattled, persecuted during this time. God wants to encourage his people to be steadfast in times of trial, focused on that blessed rest and reward that awaits them, as opposed to the no rest that will await those that take the mark and his image uh, is worship. So from verse 14 through 16 now, this is picture number six. So we're kind of working our way through these six little pictures, all of them showing the same thing, that Christ is victor. And this one is the gathering of the harvest. And I'm going to just, I'm going to read the 14, 15, and 16, and then we're going to kind of break them down and look at these verses. And so it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple. That's Sorry, that's the next one. Verse 16 ends. So the Son of Man and the sickle is what we want to think about at this time. The Son of Man is no longer seen as the sower of the good seed. Right? He, remember, he's the one that went out, the sower went out to sow, and he sowed good seed. Now he's the reaper, but he's the reaper of an evil harvest. This is the picture that's in view. Now notice again, it's the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown. 
and I, I just want to give a, a kind of, this is a quotation from Spurgeon, but I thought it's, it was very delightful. He says this, how different it will be to see him with a crown of gold upon his head from what it was to see him wearing that terrible crown of thorns, which the cruel soldiers plated and thrust upon his brow. The word used here does not usually refer to the diadem of power, but to the crown won in conflict. It's the Stephanus, the victor's crown, the one who overcame and won the victory. And it is very remarkable that it should be said that when Christ comes to judge the world, he will wear the garland of victory, the crown which he has won in the great battle which he has fought. How significant of his final triumph will that crown of gold be about those brows that were once covered with bloody sweat when he was fighting the battle for our salvation. So here he comes, wearing the victor's crown. And so he says, and I looked and beheld. What a scene John sees here. And now we've got kind of two closing scenes we, we, we said there's number six and number seven and uh, number six the gathering the harvest um, number seven is the treading of the wine press and so it's interesting that you've got in israel's calendar you know you have the the gathering in of the wheat harvest and then at the end of the time frame you have the gathering of the wine harvest and so you've got both of these harvests that have been seen here in these two uh, sections and so <clears throat> the closing scenes basically show that the followers of the, the beast are absolutely doomed. There's a picture of a harvest and a vintage. Now, I want to give you the background of what we're looking at from verse 14, really down to verse 20 at the end. We're really kind of seeing what was prophesied in the Lord's parables of the kingdom. I want us to go back to Matthew 13, because we're going to see uh, Matthew 13's kind of fulfillment at this point in history. Matthew 13, verse 30, we read this. It's concerning the, the wheat and the tares, and it says, let both grow together until the harvest. So this is that harvest. And in, in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Again, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. And so this is what, what is in view here. The harvest is overripe. This is the wheat and the tares. Satan's tares have now become fully ripe and are about to be reaped they'll be gathered into the the garner or, or into the fire you know the, the chaff and they'll be burned and those that are left those that are the uh, the true loyal followers of the lord jesus will enter into the millennial kingdom so this is the picture that's in view it's the harvest of satan's sowing is about to be reaped the tares this is not john 4 the Lord Jesus, lift up your eyes, you know, kind of the fields are white, ready to harvest. This is a, this is Satan's harvest now. Uh, Satan's harvest is overripe and about to be reaped. And so uh, the gathering out of the tares, human sin will have finally reached its zenith, its peak, <laughs> if you like. And uh, under the beast and uh, under the false prophet, and judgment is about to fall. Now, let me just show you where elsewhere in Scripture how this idea of, of a harvest of the wicked to judgment is used in Scripture. And we want to just see just one example in Jeremiah chapter 51. But it's a very clear example. Jeremiah chapter 51 and verse 33. Just to again affirm uh, that these concepts uh, that we've seen in Revelation are uh, concepts that are found elsewhere in the word of God. Jeremiah 51 and verse 33, where we read this. It says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, 
The daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her. Yet a little while and the time of her harvest shall come. So he's talking about the ultimate judgment on Babylon, the Babylon that had taken Israel into captivity. And he's talking about the time of her harvest shall come and the threshing floor and have been beaten out, as it were. So it must be remembered that evil has its harvest as well as good. There's a harvest of misery and woe, a harvest for the gathering, binding and burning of the tares, as well for the gathering of the wheat into the garner. And so it's a judgment scene. The title of the Son of Man is connects the Son of Man uh, frequently in Scripture with judgment. Uh, we'll give you just one such example that is very clear. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse 27. John 5, 27, a very familiar Scripture. But it says, And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. The very fact that he's the Son of Man, that gives him title and rightness to judge. And so it talks about this, this harvest, and it tells us it's ripe. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's ripe for judgment. Thrust in thy sickle, reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Uh, that means it's, it's dry, it's withered. And again, that's a picture of the long-suffering of God. The tares had been allowed to ripen to the stage where holiness demanded the sickle of judgment. And he's going to come crowned with his golden crown, right? The victor's crown. He's going to come on this white cloud stressing righteousness, the righteousness of God in judgment, the righteousness of the Son of Man to execute this judgment. And the parallel, Revelation 19, 11, he's going to also come on a white horse. And then the, the great white throne judgment, he's going to sit on a white throne. And each of these things suggests that his justice will be fully seen. He will judge in perfect righteousness. The sharp sickle indicates the severity of the judgment. And the hour to reap was come. And then the final one, picture number seven, is the treading of the wine press and so it says in verse 17 another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven he also having a sharp sickle another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe and the angel thrust in his sickle to the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. The blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. So here's our final kind of scene, scene number seven. And again, a tremendous judgment scene, the treading of the winepress. The outcome of divine holiness is in view here because he comes out of the temple, which is in heaven. And it's the open temple is telling us that this is coming from God. Divine holiness is being applied to the earth. God um, is very patient. He doesn't judge until the iniquity of the Amorites is full. He doesn't judge until the harvest is fully ripe here till the mystery of iniquity has reached its zenith and God's long suffering has come to an end and it's now time for that judgment. And so <clears throat> if the temple reflects the holiness of God that had to be vindicated, so this angel comes out of the temple of God and says, thrust in the sickle. And so again, the holiness of God has to be vindicated. Notice too, another angel comes out of the altar. It says, verse 18, another angel came out from the altar. And the altar, again, would speak of God's provision for sinners, which has been rejected. And so God's holiness has been vindicated. God's provision has been re rejected. And so the time of judgment has fully come. So the vine of the earth refers to the nations of men who are taken up with the earth. They're the earth dwellers. These people of no regard for God 
Uh, wickedness marks them to the full. These earth dwellers have reached the pinnacle of their wickedness, and it's time to judge. And so the angel and the sickle says, the grapes are fully ripened. Satan and his angel agents have sown, and now the earth yields a dreadful harvest. The fields of the earth are cleared of all that the enemy has sown. It pictures grapes that are fully grown in the prime, almost bursting with juice. And the spurting of the grape juice from under the bare feet of those treading the grapes in the wine press is compared to the spurting of blood and speaks of the awful human carnage that is about to occur at this judgment. What strength have grapes against the weight and power of a man when he comes to set his feet on them? And the riper they are, the more helpless. The heel of omnipotence is upon them, and they can only break and sink beneath it. And so when the sixth angel pours out his vial in Revelation 16, it's going to gather men to the battle of Armageddon. And that's when we're going to see, as it were, this, this great wine press of the wrath of God brought to conclusion. Now, I want to just make a few references in tying this seventh picture to the Armageddon judgment. And I want you to look with me in Isaiah 63. And I want you to think about Armageddon, maybe in a little different way. We tend to think of it as the battle of Armageddon. But I want you to think of it as the campaign of Armageddon. Because I want to suggest to you that there's going to be various locations where this is going to take place, this campaign of Armageddon. And the first one is in Isaiah 63, which is going to be in Bosra, in Edom, which I find very interesting. Because if, if we're correct in suggesting that this place that God has prepared in the wilderness for Israel to hide is Petra in Edom, it would make sense then that the beast will send many of his forces into Edom, as it were, to try to wipe out these ones that are protected. And so Isaiah 63, we'll just take a minute to read verses 1 through 6 and just see the parallels here. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury is upheld me. It upheld me, and I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drink in my drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. So could it be that as Christ comes to deal with the battle of Armageddon or the campaign, the first place he begins is Bosra in Edom. And he comes out from Bosra, just his garments stained with, with as it were, the blood of the, the wine fat. And then he goes into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Uh, again, for that, we look at the prophecy of Joel. We're going to be quick here because um, our time is just about gone and we have a whole battle to cover in a couple of minutes. So Joel, prophecy of Joel chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That means the battle of Jehovah judges will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Verses 12 through 14. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about 
put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get ye down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision or the valley of that which is determined. And so this is going to be the decisive battle here. And then, of course, the final one in Revelation 16 and verse 6, where we have the very familiar language of Armageddon. Revelation 16 and verse 6, it says this. <clears throat> Sorry, it must be verse 16. Yep, and he hath gathered them together unto a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So it's kind of interesting if you look at these these together, uh, you'll see that Bosra is in the east, Megiddo is in the north, and and then uh, Armageddon, Armageddon is in the south. And so it really covers the whole land of Israel. <laughs> the whole land is in view. It's become an armed camp. It's become the scene of a great battle, of terrible carnage, of blood spurting and splattering as high as the horse's bridles. And it tells us the length of this. Uh, it says um, in verse um, 21, it says... Um, and I'm still in chapter 16, verse 20. It says, The winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came up to the winepress, even to the horses' bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. 1,600 furlongs is 883.9 um, uh, miles, 295 kilometers. Now, it's interesting. Uh, from Dan to Beersheba, the whole length of Israel is 200 miles. So this is saying that the whole length of the land will be a battlefield. It goes up to the horses' bridles in terms of their uh, the spattering of the blood, such as the carnage. And so what's the whole point? Well, the point is simply this, that when in Revelation 13, it seemed like the beast and the false prophet were unconquerable. Nobody could defeat them. Revelation 14 has a simple message in seven pictures. These seven pictures tell us this. Who is really triumphant? And it's not the beast. And it's not the false prophet. And it's not the dragon. The one who is triumphant is none other than Christ. He is the one. God, Christ, his Messiah, his people, not Satan. And his Messiah, the Antichrist, and his followers are the victors. So what a comfort. Our time is gone. May God bless us with these thoughts. Amen.